Hello, everybody. We're on Chapter 4 of Justo Gonzalez's book, Christianity in Latin America. And this is, I think, the fifth or sixth lecture in a series for my new Religion in Latin America class. Hopefully, this will be this course will be part of a series of uh, six or eight classes that you'll be able to take for a certificate on religion in Latin America. So let's get started with this. This week we're talking about reform movements in uh, colonial Latin America. And we're now up to the 18th century, which was a period of reform in Latin America. The 16th and the 17th centuries, uh, the Spanish church was struggling to find its place. Don Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala suggested that the king should let the true Christians, in other words, the Indians, govern the India, Indies. He himself was a mestizo. Uh, I believe his mother was an, was an uh, Incan princess, and his father was a conquistador. And he was advocating in his writings for a return to Indian government, Christian Indian government, of course. Fray Francisco de Avila, who zealously tried to eradicate any vestiges of indigenous religions in the Andes. And a number of, uh, we've already seen some of these campaigns of extirpation. The ecclesi ecclesiastical authorities made Herculean efforts to impose hegemony and homogeneity over religious practices through the expansion of the monastic orders, uh, increasing the number of clergy, and the establishment of institutional structures, which would include monasteries and nunneries, convents, dioce uh, dioceses, and archdiocese structures, cofradias. However, as the 18th century uh, arrived, it brought about cataclysmic changes in Latin America. And these transformations in the 18th century eventually would result in these countries, former Spanish, um, uh, f former Spanish uh, colonies, to seek their independence from Spain, severing the church, in effect, from the Iberian crowns. The Bourbon reforms were carried out in the Spanish territories, and this is named after the French Bourbon family, royal family, that came to the throne in 1713 and uh, took over the administration of the Spanish Empire from the, the Habsburgs, who had died out with lack of heirs. The War of Spanish Succession took place from 1700 to 1713, uh, the Spanish crown was now under an emphasis uh, on the power of the monarch and the relationship of the colonies to the metropolis. This was an emphasis that was highly influenced by Enlightenment thought. The last Habsburg emperor died with no heirs, and uh, he, he named Philip of Anjou to be his uh, heir, who uh, was from the French House of Bourbon igniting a war that took 13 years to resolve. So the Bourbon, French Bourbons came to the throne and began to apply uh, rationality, bureaucratic rationality and ideas from the Enlightenment to the management of the, uh, of the Spanish monarchy in the Western Hemisphere. A similar set of reforms came about in Portugal and Brazil under the Marquis, Marquis of Pombal, uh, who was very hostile towards the church and very much influenced by the Enlightenment. In Portugal, there was a new attitude towards Brazil, evident in the actions of the Marquis de Pombal, who was the Minister of State and the head of foreign policy. Among the many reforms in Portugal and Spain, both Iberian countries sought to tighten their control over their respective colonies in order to increase wealth extraction, in other words, taxes. So taxes went up and control was tightened down. Something, as you can imagine, the, the uh, white Creoles in both Brazil and in the Spanish uh, colonies were not happy about. In both cases, the political authorities in Spain and Portugal believed that the church was an obstacle. 
especially the religious orders. At the same time, there was a push into the borderlands, particularly, well, both in Brazil and the Spanish colonies, but in the Spanish colonies uh, up into the the southwest of uh, what's called, what's currently in the United States, northern Mexico, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, also into the borderlands in southern Argentina. The 1598, the first permanent mission in modern day, modern day New Mexico was established in 15, I said that, 1598. In 1680, the Pueblo Indians revolted against the Spanish and for a short time triumphed, uh, driving the Spanish out of New Mexico. But in 1692, they returned and reconquered the lands lost to the Pueblo people. In 1687, Jesuit friar Eusebio Francisco Quino traveled to the Sonora Desert. And then Father Juan Maria Salvatierra moved into the Baja California and founded Misión Nuestra Señora de Loreto Concho, Our Lady of Loreto, the mother mission of all such establishments in California. In Texas, you had uh, the founding of San Antonio in 1718 and 1762. Louisiana became a, a Spanish holding. The French uh, turned it over to the Spanish. The Jesuits were expelled from the Spanish Empire, so uh, Charles III designated the Jesuits to carry out the task of settling California in 1767. Lots of dates and names and figures. <clears throat> Father Junipero Serra was a Jesuit priest who traveled up through California. He's uh, honored by some traditionally in California, but he is not without some uh, controversy over his role as a priest and as a father of California. He used physical punishment to coerce Indians into forced labor, but he cautioned that the punishment not be too severe. Uh, one might say that in uh, Father Serra, one sees both faces of the church in the same person, which is why he's an ambiguous figure. There was a large drop in the population in California of Native Americans from 300,000 to 200,000, uh, also for disease and many of the other the same reasons or declines in the Caribbean. But the debate still continues as what as to what his efforts wrought for the Indians of the West Coast. Did he advocate policies for the treatment of Indians that were excessive? Was he merely a product of his times? Father Serra reflects the two faces of the church in one person. Forces in Europe. There was change, winds of change blowing in Europe. The 18th century opened with Spain in complete turmoil. The last Habsburg king, Charles II, died without children. He was mentally, mentally and physically enfeebled from birth. He was called the Ichisado. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to translate that. It has to do with sorcery. The, uh, but I don't know how to say it in that tense. Um, but the idea was that he was cursed. Uh, because of, and he probably was born that way because of inbreeding in the royal family. He ascended to the throne of Spain at the age of four. During the last year of his life, after a nominal reign of 35 years, he wrote a will passing the crown to his grandnephew, Philip of Anjou, a younger grandson to Louis Fourteenth of France and a Bourbon. He, uh, Philip of Anjou accepted the throne after 13 years of warfare with England and uh, Austria and even the Vatican weighed in on in the conflict. And he accepted the throne of the Spanish Empire and became Philip V. He broke off relations with the Pope, Pope Clement XI in 1709, for supporting one of his rivals. Politics and religion do not mix. Relations between the Spanish and monarchy and the Pope continued to be tense for the next 40 years. 
So during the cur uh, during the course of the 18th century, there were three Bourbon kings: Philip V, Ferdinand VI, and Charles III. Charles III, by far, was the most energetic and the most capable. By mid-century, Ferdinand VI was able to achieve a the Patronato Universal from the Pope in the Concordat of 1753. Charles III was strongly influenced by regalism and the Enlightenment, regalism being the philosophy of absolute monarchy, and he moved to subject the church in Spanish territories to become a servant of the crown rather than a partner. Free thinking was not part of Spain's Enlightenment. It's important to realize that there were various enlightenments in Europe. Uh, there was a Scottish enlightenment that was somewhat different than the uh, French enlightenment, but there was also a Spanish and a Portuguese enlightenment which carried over into the New World, uh, which emphasized rationality and science, empiricism, uh, absolute monarchy. Uh, it did not include the idea of free thinking and human rights. There were a number of church councils that took place during this time. Four councils took place in the Indies, in Mexico City, in Lima, later in Caracas, which I misspelled there, I see. Uh, should be no H, just delete the H out. And Santa Fe de Bogota, where I used to live and loved dearly. It was a great place to live. These councils accomplished little. Reforms began with the effort to abolish clerical privileges, known as fueros. Fueros had been a part of church life for centuries and provided individual clergy with immunity from civil jurisdiction. Um, the clergy in France had something similar, uh, as, as did the nobility, and I do not remember what it's called in French, but uh, the nobility, the first estate and the second estate were were exempt from paying taxes. The taxes fell upon the bourgeoisie or the third estate, the poor, the working classes. In other words, the people who could least afford it were the ones that had the heaviest burden. Um, in other words, the members of the clergy could not be prosecuted or sentenced in civil court, nor could they be subject to any form of coercion, such as torture or arrest, at the hands of civil authorities. Rather, they would only subject to ecclesiastical courts and judges. This brings us up to the expulsion of the Jesuits. If you watched the film The Mission, you you saw some of the political maneuvering and some of the issues leading up to just before the expulsion of Jesuits from Brazil and from the Spanish territories of Latin America, then later on from Europe. In Paraguay, the Jesuits were accused of creating a powerful and theocratic state within a state. And there may be some truth to that accusation. The primary reason for expelling the Jesuits was this: the state felt threatened. Uh, the state was attempting to amass greater power uh, through the Bourbon reforms in Paraguay and elsewhere, and the Pombalin reforms in Brazil. The state was attempting to increase taxation, streamline its bureaucracy, rationalize its bureaucracy, and increase its power, the state power, and the Jesuits stood in the way, frankly. Reasons why the Jesuits were vulnerable included their wealth, uh, with all of the uh, congregaciones or aldeas or reducciones that they managed in Latin America where Indians were working and producing and living communally in many cases. Uh, this and the fact that the Jesuits lived frugally for the most part, this added up to a, a tremendous accrual of wealth in the hands of the society. It also, the society controlled educational institutions, uh, which gave it too much influence. Each generation of uh, young Spanish Creoles were being uh, uh, in the New World and it's Spanish p Peninsulares in the Old World in Europe were being educated by Jesuits into a Jesuit worldview. 
its members were not very loyal to royal authority. Uh, they were loyal directly and singularly to the Pope. And so this was another uh, problem for the monarchy. They were opposed to the Bourbon reforms. They vowed obedience directly to the Pope. They were expelled from Portugal for stirring up a conspiracy against the king and from France for, for financial malfeasance. The head of the Jesuit order uh, set in, in Spain said that Charles III was an illegitimate child. Pope Clement Fourteenth suppressed the entire order in 1773. By this time, they had already been expelled from all of the Spanish American colonies. Uh, they had been expelled from Brazil. They had been expelled from Spain and Portugal. They were expelled from France. And then finally, the Pope himself uh, suppressed the entire order. And they uh, this meant, uh, this created a huge problem for thousands of Jesuit priests uh, about where to go and what to do. It was not until 1813 that the Society of Jesus was able to reorganize. In the colonies, 2,200 Jesuits were expelled. Many of them were Creoles who knew nothing else but life in the Americas. In Peru, 203 haciendas and over 5,000 slaves were seized from the Jesuit order. In Cuba, 21 Jesuits owned three sugar mills, farms, houses, slaves, Many Indians that were under the protection of the order were now more vulnerable to the demands of the colonists. And this action against the Jesuits was a warning to the rest. It went a long way towards creating a compliant and subservient church to serve as a tool of the state and to implement Charles III's authority. Studies show that during the uh, f beginning around the middle of the 17th century uh, through the 18th, uh, there was a steady decline of church authority and influence in society. Uh, although the book doesn't go into this, this might coincide with a period of secularization that uh, accelerated after the Enlightenment. But in 1690 came more evidence that the church's influence on social mores was in decline. In that year, there was a clear break in the number of secret marriages of the Mexican church that, that the church was willing to perform. Up to that time, roughly two-thirds of the couples who faced parental opposition to their marriage were able to go to church officials and seek a wedding, secret, a secret marriage, because the church dispensed with the rec required bans and married the couples in secret especially if there was a pregnancy. So the church would go over the heads of the parents and go ahead and perform the wedding. But after 1690, the church used secret marriages only to protect the honor of deflowered women from the highest social class, who also often had some connection to the church. Also, by the 1700s, the church was losing the ability to enforce the promise to marry. In 1776, Charles III made that process official. He issued the Real Pragmatica, or the Royal Pragmatic, that declared that civil authority rather than ecclesiastical courts would settle marriage matters of marriage conflicts. The deterioration of ecclesiastical authority was also obvious in efforts to reform mon monastic life. So now the civil authority is in charge of marriage not the ecclesiastical court, which is a clear step towards a greater secular secularization of society. Another factor that's going on during this time is the rise of liberalism. Uh, let me go here. Liberalism is a philosophy that includes such things as guaranteeing civil liberties in a written document. Um, that would be a, a written constitution. Um, equality before the law, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, religious toleration, limited government, free markets, all of those things are aspects of liberalism. Sometimes liberalism also included 
some measure of anti-clericalism. Anti-clericalism is the belief that priests should stay out of politics. It's not necessarily anti-religious or anti-Christian, but it's a view of even faithful Catholics that the church should not be involved in uh, calling the shots politically. When the French occupied Spain in the early 19th century, the Spanish monarch Ferdinand VII was forced to abdicate. And in 1808, Joseph Bonaparte uh, was imposed on the Spanish by Napoleon, and he was crowned king of Spain and all of its possessions. However, the Spanish weren't down with that. They rebelled. Uh, and they began to fight back against the French, not in pitched warfare, but it, this is actually the invention of guerrilla, uh, little wars. It doesn't mean guerrilla. Uh, guerrilla, gu guerrilla is little wars in Spanish, and it's hit and run, using hit and run and hiding tactics to fight against a superior enemy. And that's what the people of Spain did. They they formed uh, bands, they went to the mountains, they began to fight against the French in, uh, in a guerrilla warfare. Instead, in 1810, a national par parliament or Cortes ultimately formed in Cadiz, a region of Spain not under French control. Similar bodies also arose in the colonies. The return of Ferdinand in 1814 was not greeted with much enthusiasm. He tried unsuccessfully to reinstate an absolutist monarchy. You can't turn the clock back. Sadly, many leaders in history have failed to learn that lesson. Examples of lower level clergy who supported liberal ideals and independence include uh, Mexican Creole Padre Hidalgo, who is the one who uh, issued the cry of the uh, El Grito de Dolores, which mobilized Mexican peasants and Indians in revolt against the Spanish, and the mestizo priest Jose Maria Morelos. Uh, so in Mexico, the first two rebel leaders were both priests, but they were, they were uh, from the lower orders, a Creole and a mestizo, they were not in the elite. In Brazil, the clergy had a wholly different relationship with the state than its counterpart in Spanish America. Even though the Brazilian clergy was also subject to royal patronage through the Padroado Real. The Portuguese monarchy's control over the Brazilian church was much looser administratively. The, and I've mentioned this before, but the uh, decrees of the Council of Trent, which served as the Catholic Counter-Reformation in 1540, uh, these decrees were not implemented in Brazil until the 19th century, which is one of the reasons for a significant difference in the way that Brazilian Catholicism and Spanish Catholicism or Spanish-American Catholicism developed. In 1822, the process of independence was so peaceful that the church never experienced the divisions created by similar movements in Spanish America. Uh, basically, Brazil just slipped into a uh, empire, and one of the royal house, Pedro I, stayed in Brazil after his father left, and became the Brazilian monarch. So it was uh, it was a nonviolent uh, revolution. The institutional presence of the Catholic Church in Brazil left a far less profound imprint than did the Church in Spanish America. Quilombos or Macombos, Macombos were communities of runaway blacks in Brazil. Uh, they also sometimes had white as well as Indian residents in addition to Africans. The most famous and successful of these was Palmares in northeastern Brazil. Uh, it began around 1590. It evolved into an alliance of 11 different communities with about 20,000 to 30,000 inhabitants who were effectively, uh, who effectively repelled Portuguese efforts to eradicate the Confederation for more than a hundred years, they resisted until they finally were defeated in 1694. The most famous leader of Palmares was 
uh, the uh, was the king Zumbi. Palinques are, is another word for this, basically the same thing as a quilombo, but in Spanish. And these existed in Spanish America, Mexico, and Cuba. While adopting traditional Catholic practices, Afro-American slave religion was much like that of the quilombos, a mixture of African, Indian, and European. Within the rural slave communities, the practice of traditional African religions could often be hidden within Catholicism or simply practiced in secret. Many African deities made the middle passage with the Africans who were being carried into slavery, surviving the crossing and being incorporated into the experience of bondage. So in conclusion, the 18th century was one of great paradox for the church in the Americas. When we say the church, of course, we're referring to the Catholic Church, although it was not homogeneous. There were many different strands and streams within the church. And as we've seen, the two faces that Justo Gonzalez talks about, precisely as it was expanding into the northern reaches of Alta California, its power in Latin American society was contracting. Each American society itself viewed the church with less deference relying more on its own understanding of what was morally right and wrong and less on the church's definitions. And so that concludes uh, chapter four on reform movements within Catholicism in Latin America. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll talk to you next week. Take care.